Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of some of my recent non-fiction reading. So first up, I listened to the audio version of Richard Wagamese's Embers, the subheading on which is one of Ojibwe's meditations. It's interesting, he wrote one traditional memoir before he died. He also had a book that is structured as a letter to his son. And this in part feels like a memoir, but also partially feels like a journal. And some of it does feel straightforward, like meditations, thinking about the earth and humanity. And some of it is him working through things through the framework of talking to an old woman or an old man who are guiding him through his experience of life and his relationship to the creator. But he writes it in a way that you could fill creator in with whatever deity or spiritual system or just, I don't know, humanist, whatever, that you structure your meditations or spiritual conversations around. So it's interesting that way because it is both very specific and very general in a way that I did find kind of surprising. I always say this, I'm not very spiritual and like, no, keep the woo woo away from me. But I thought this was lovely and I really enjoyed it, which surprised me because I genuinely picked it up because it was short and I wanted something to fill a very particular amount of time. And this did that, but was kind of above and beyond. So yeah, I think if you are a fan of his work in general, it's worth picking up. But also if you are interested in exploring a spiritual perspective that manages to be both very general and very specific at once, I think that's really interesting. So next up, I finished listening to a book that I had started reading last year and or earlier this year, I can no longer remember what is time. And that was Carmen Maria Machado's In the Dream House. This, a lot of people on booktube have talked about at great length, so I don't know how much more I can add to that conversation, but it is a memoir of an emotionally and verbally abusive relationship that she was in, and the complexities of how society views abusive same-sex relationships in a different way than they do when it is a man abusing a woman. And it's structured very interestingly, though it's primarily written in the second person, but we have brief bits where she does talk about herself in the first person, but it's only when she's outside of the relationship, so it's essentially before the relationship starts and then after it ends. And the chat, the way that we work through the chapters kind of goes back and forth between actual events bits of pop culture. There's one chapter that's entirely about an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. In a lot of ways it's structured almost like an atmospheric horror novel even though it's a memoir. So stylistically I really loved this. I thought it was really interestingly written and I liked the choices she was making. I've said this before, I'm not the biggest fan of domestic dramas in either fiction or non-fiction, so watching relationships come together and fall apart is not something I enjoy, although when we're talking about an anatomy of a bad or abusive relationship, it's maybe silly to talk about whether you enjoy it or not, but I did frequently feel like, eh, but um, that just is what it is, right? But yeah, the, the style was top notch. And actually, if you've read other memoirs that do stylistically interesting things in their telling of a memoir story, um, I'd love to hear more about which ones you've enjoyed because I've read a lot of memoirs that kind of cross over between memoir and autofiction or that cross over between memoir and poetry. But this with the atmospheric horror elements and the pop culture elements was an interesting twist. So I really liked that bit of it. Next up, I read another book that ties in with the former Yugoslavia project that I was doing last month and that I've continued into this month because it was for Women in Translation Month, but this is a book that was written in English and I had a couple of other books by men that I'll talk about later. This is Slavinka Draculich's How We Survived Communism and Even Laughed. Most of these are essays that were written for Ms. Magazine in the late 80s, and they're essentially trying to explain the lives of women under communism in a bunch of different countries to an Anglo-American audience. So it's very interesting because it is this portrait of the very end of the Cold War, and, but it is limited in a sense because she is writing for a foreign audience. So she is in large part poking at their assumptions about what life behind the Iron Curtain was like. So it's less explaining people's lives than explaining people's lives versus this other set of assumptions. So some of that's brilliant. There's some great bits where she's describing how in a lot of countries women never had washing machines. And so even if you live in a society where there's supposed to be gender equality, if every, if the women are still stuck having to wa hand wash all the clothes, this is kind of symbolic of 
things that are missing from the structure of the society. There are also bits about going to New York City and seeing homeless people and looking at the discrepancies in wealth that were present in the West that were not present uh, in the Warsaw Pact countries at that time. And how oh, she talks about going, I think it was her and a, she's Croatian, she was with a, I think, Romanian writer, and they talk about having never seen homeless people before at that point. The one sort of flaw, but also power of this book, is that she was writing right before Yugoslavia broke up, right before the war started. In the afterward, she essentially comments that the final submission of this, aside from the afterward, was literally days before the war started. And so it does sit on this moment where you can feel that she's seeing one possibility and that's not the future that happened. There was this other future that she hadn't expected would happen. And I think when you read a lot of books from her generation and the generations that were just at or a little younger who were just at adulthood in the early 90s, you see this difference in people who thought that the war was inevitable and who thought that and who were shocked that it happened. And she's clearly on the side of the ones who were shocked that it happened, but it's really interesting to be right at the precipice of that and have that moment. So on the one hand, it feels like she's not giving the reader any warning that people who were reading this at the moment it was published were missing out on something that was essentially simultaneously happening and saying, well, where did that come from? But at the same time, the kind of acknowledgement that the awareness that she was shocked by that too is really interesting. So yeah, it's worth the read. It's one of these things, I don't think all of it's necessarily aged well, but it is very clearly written for a very specific audience at a very specific time. And that's kind of interesting in and of itself. Next up, I listened to the audio version of Jessica J. Lee's Two Trees Make a Forest. As with In the Dream House, this is a book that I actually started reading and finished listening to because that was just how the library holds came in. It is narrated by the author. The other one is too, actually. I don't think I mentioned that. This is an interesting kind of genre blend in that it is not quite nature writing. It is not quite a family memoir and it's not quite an ecological history, but it's a bit of all of three of those things. So the author is a Canadian writer who lives in Germany and her mother was born in Taiwan to parents who had come from China because they'd been from middle-class families. And she is exploring their lives in Taiwan and their relationship to Taiwan as this country that her mother grew up in and that her grandparents essentially achieved adulthood in, but that, you know, it's not their indigenous country. It's not the country to which they've moved back. It's not where their extended families were because they're in China. And so it's, it's a kind of interesting in-between piece when you look at uh, memoirs where, some, where people with immigrant parents are moving back to somewhere. It is the kind of in-between, the, the countries that were stepping stones, essentially which is something that I'm always interested in because uh, my family and my ex-in-law's family also are people who that multi-country steps along the immigration process because I think a lot of family stories about immigration are you start in one country and end in another and it's this point to point and that's true for a lot of people but it's definitely not true for everybody so uh, I enjoyed that element. I, it's also a bit about hiking because a lot of this is about she goes to Taiwan and does hiking with some kind of meetup type groups and that's interesting about people she meets there's bits about language and how her Mandarin is not that good but people regularly say oh good for a foreigner but then she says her mother's from Taiwan and they're like oh actually bad for that um, which is great fun she's also an ecological or environmental historian by training and so a lot of this is about volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and wildlife and soil types and it's a great mix of all of these things. So I think if you're interested in environmental history and geology and as well as language and family and all of those pieces, this is fantastic. But I think if you're looking for a book about hiking or a book about family or a book about birds in Taiwan, this is not that book because it's bits and pieces of all of those things. But it doesn't have a central focus, which I think is both a strength and a weakness depending on how you're approaching this. So I was entertained and engaged. I guess entertained sounds weird because like her grandmother lived through the rape of Nanking. So entertained is maybe not the right word for all of it, but it's good stuff. And finally, I listened to a 
celebrity book that's read by the author, which is normally what I like with celebrity books, and that is Amber Ruffin's collection of stories that her sister told her about racist encounters. And it is a weird book. The audio version is interesting because in parts she will do things like tell you the secret knock or sing song. Uh, there are clearly pictures in the book that she describes and some of the descriptions are funny and sometimes she'll even say audio exclusive as she adds things to them. So that's fun. The collection of stories themselves though just... I don't know. The, the title of this book is You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey. But most of the stories were pretty believable. There, it, it's basically an unending litany of racial microaggressions and sometimes aggressions because there's a lot of being dragged places by security guards in childhood and getting fired and things. Feels almost mistitled. Like I can't imagine that anyone doesn't believe that this stuff happens, right? When it's funny, it is quite funny. And in bits, uh, the sister L Lacey Lamar comes on and they actually have some back and forth dialogue bits and there are bits and pieces where they'll talk about their family growing up and all of that is really funny and some of the social commentary where she contrasts things that have happened at work to her in New York City and things that happened to her sister at work in Omaha are kind of an interesting social portrait but most of this is just as I said a litany of microaggressions and okay but it's not, but it's framed as here's a funny story and it's not that funny or here's an unbelievable story and it's not that unbelievable. So I was left wondering, I don't know. Uh, so it wasn't entirely successful, I guess is what I'm saying. In any case, that is the nonfiction that I've read lately or listened to. If you have consumed any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought. And yeah, that's it for now. Ciao.